Chelsea Palace Studios, London, England, February 23rd, 1959. Right this way, Miss Holiday, the stage manager says, as he leads Billie Holiday down a dark corridor, parts the stage curtain, and she regally glides past him. She crosses the stage, pats the piano player on the back, and finds her place at the mic. The lights dim, as a hush of anticipation falls across the small studio audience. Will she sing it? For years, she has defied U.S. government orders by performing her song, Strange Fruit, a protest song about lynching in the American South. And in continuing to sing it, she's jeopardized not just her career, but her very life. The piano player hits the first note, and her voice fills the room with the pain and suffering of seeing scores of innocent black men hanging from trees. When it's over, the mesmerized audience stands and gives her a thunderous ovation. Thanks so much to Brilliant for helping us make today's history sing. Billie Holiday was born Eleanor Harris on April 7, 1915 in Philadelphia, and her childhood was a difficult one. Defined by a father who left the family to pursue a musical career, and a mother unprepared to be a single parent. Regardless, Eleanor ended up in Maryland with her mother Sadie. Mom had to work, so Eleanor was often left unsupervised, which led her to fall into truancy, and she wound up in a reform school. And though briefly returning home at age 10, she wound up back in the same reform school months later, but this time in protective custody, after a neighbor sexually assaulted her while her mother was at work. Though at 12, she was free again, earning money running errands for a brothel and house cleaning for neighbors. And it was in these houses and travels around the city where she first discovered jazz, specifically the music of giants like Bessie Smith and Louis Armstrong. In the late 1920s, Eleonora and her mother moved to Harlem, where she went through a brief stint as a sex worker and served jail time as a result. Then she caught a break, singing in her first nightclub gig in 1933, and she never looked back. And it was during one of those Harlem performances that she caught the attention of music producer John Hammond and Benny Goodman, a band leader destined for greatness. Despite her lack of formal vocal training, these men recognized Eleonora's raw talent and considered her unique timbre and raw vocalizations as strengths rather than weaknesses. And with her career taking off, she put a stage name together, deciding to call herself Billy after an actress she admired, and Holiday after the name of the man she believed to be her biological father. And two years into her music career, Billy Holiday's success reached meteoric heights as jazz culture, which you can learn more about in our Harlem Renaissance episode, began to morph into what would be known as the swing era. From her collaborations with tenor sax icon and soon-to-be bestie Lester the Prez Young, to a tour with the Count Basie Orchestra in 1937, she was a bona fide superstar. And things kept going up. A year after the Basie tour, Artie Shaw's orchestra asked her to tour with them, making her the first African-American singer to front for a white band. A brave thing for everyone involved at the time. Though, ironically, not long before that, the fair-skinned Holiday had been told to darken her complexion, lest audiences think she was a white woman singing with a black band. Despite initial success and accolades, racism plagued the Shaw tour courtesy of prejudiced club promoters and segregation laws, which prevented the band from dining at restaurants. Frustrated, Billy abandoned the tour midway, and it was around this time she first encountered the song that would define her career, Strange Fruit. More of a poem, the lyrics had been written by Abel Mirapol, a Bronx school teacher of Jewish descent, appalled by stories of black men being lynched in the South. At first, Holiday was frightened to perform it, but she soon found the nerve. Then there was just one problem. Columbia, her record label at the time, wanted nothing to do with the song. But knowing that Strange Fruit was important, she jumped over to an independent label, Commodore Records, and laid down the track. Empowered by the song's chart-topping success, Holiday went on to perform it everywhere and anywhere, often closing her show's performances with it, whether it made white audiences uncomfortable or not. The pairing of Mirapol's words and Holiday's emotive and unique singing style gave every performance a soul-searing quality. And because of the success of Strange Fruit and other songs like the American music staple God Bless the Child, a host of other opportunities manifested over the years, including movie roles with Bassey and Armstrong and concerts in large venues like Carnegie Hall. But her growing success and activism also led to unwanted attention from a dangerous source. Harry Anslinger was the head of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics and an Omega-level racist, the kind of racist that even startled other racists with how far he was willing to take things and he wanted to destroy Billie Holiday. It started with a 1939 letter from Anslinger's office to Billie, forbidding her from performing the song again, ever. To her credit, she ignored the threats, which naturally didn't go over well with Anslinger. Thinking that Holiday represented everything America had to be afraid of, he doggedly pursued her, using her one true weakness to bring her down. Like many nightclub performers, Billie had taken to drinking. She was also unlucky in love, 
Somewhere between the boyfriends, her stormy relationship with actress Tallulah Bankhead, and her unfortunate choice for a husband, trombonist Jimmy Moore who she married in 1941, Billy was introduced to heroin. And given that she was constantly on the road among other musicians and their entourages, many struggling with one form of substance abuse or another, there was little opportunity to get clean, and addiction became a rabbit hole she could never truly climb out of. By employing both surveillance methods and bad actors, including an agent, Jimmy Fletcher, who may have attempted to romance Billy to infiltrate the holiday entourage, Anslinger was able to arrest her on drug charges in 1947. Convicted and released after a year and a day of rehabilitation in Anderson, West Virginia, she emerged to face a new challenge to her livelihood. See, because of her conviction, Billy could no longer obtain a license to perform in cabarets, nightclubs, or anywhere liquor was sold. And while she would still perform at concert halls and a sold-out Carnegie Hall show shortly after her release, the nightclub shows that made her steady income were now out of reach. So, out of desperation, she turned to John Levy a mafia enforcer who wanted to trade on Billy's reputation to open clubs of his own. Having divorced Monroe at this point, Billy made Levy her manager and eventually her husband. But unfortunately, Levy not only continued the cycle of abuse Billy was trapped in, he was also unable to protect her from Anslinger or her drug addiction. In 1949, she was again arrested for drug possession in San Francisco, but this time was acquitted. Despite this turmoil, she remained prolific, producing a large body of work over the next 10 years. And while some said her voice had changed or even weakened over time, losing power but gaining more emotional resonance, her work continued to be soul-stirring nonetheless. The London performance in 1959, the one we mentioned at the top of the episode, happened courtesy of a variety show called Chelsea at Nine and is the only video of her singing Strange Fruit. In that performance, even without the lyrics, the pain you can see in her eyes is a haunting reminder of the real violence, horror, and injustices that inspired the song. And a few months later, a physically weak holiday was admitted into the Metropolitan Hospital in New York for heart and liver problems. Though shortly after, narcotics agents claimed to find heroin in her room and arrested her again, this time handcuffing her foot to the hospital bed and removing all flowers and gifts from well-wishers. Worse still, they blocked the hospital from giving her methadone treatments that might have saved her life. She died July 17, 1959, at only 44 years old. Yes, you heard that correctly. Federal agents withheld life-saving treatment to a hospitalized jazz singer because she refused to stop singing a song about black men being murdered, meaning that much of her artisanship and bravery was acknowledged posthumously. She won three Grammys after her passing, and for heroically continuing to sing the song Strange Fruit throughout her career, she was dubbed the godmother of the civil rights movement. And in 2002, her version of Strange Fruit was even selected for preservation in the National Recording Registry for the Library of Congress as being culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. Which is very apt, since Billie Holiday didn't only carry a song, she carried the agony and turmoil that came with it. And heroically, despite knowing what the consequences for her actions might be, she did it anyway because it was the right thing to do. Once again, I really want to take a moment to thank Brilliant for their support of episodes like this one. As I'm sure you know by now, tons of us in the EC community are super passionate lifelong learners, but who also prefer to learn on our own schedule. Which is why we think Brilliant, the interactive learning environment focusing on the whole STEM set, you know, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, is perfect for learning at your own pace in a fun and interactive way. Replacing traditional lectures with hands-on lessons, complete with visual examples and a storytelling approach that is super engaging. In fact, this last week, Jeff took a break from reviewing fundamentals in foundational computer science to take a course on solar energy because he wanted to know exactly how those things on his roof work. And because a few upcoming scripts got me thinking about some mathematical concepts I didn't know too much about, I decided to dive fully off the deep end and learn about the concepts of knowledge and uncertainty themselves. After all, if I know the math behind uncertainty, that would mean I know how to get rid of it. Huh? So if you're a curious learner, just starting out or at the height of your career, you can check out Brilliant to level up your learning by going to brilliant.org slash extra credits and signing up for free. Not to mention, the first 200 people that go to that link will also get 20% off an annual premium subscription, which added bonus really does help out our channel in the process. Aw, look at you being all smart and kind at the same time. Thanks for that. The most legendary thanks to Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Angelo Valenciana, Archelite Games, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, and Kyle Murgatroyd. 